Good evening and welcome to this meeting of the Commonwealth Club. You can find the club online at commonwealthclub.org, on Facebook and Twitter, and on the club's YouTube channel. I'm George Dobbins, Vice President of Programs at the Commonwealth Club, and it's now my pleasure to introduce today's special guests. Max Brooks is a fellow at the Modern War Institute at West Point and has served as senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Art of Future Warfare Project. He's also a noted author whose books include World War Z and Oral History of the Zombie War, which was made into a film starring Brad Pitt, as many of you may remember. Lieutenant Colonel Matt Cavanaugh, Ph.D., is a U.S. Army strategist and fellow at the Modern War Institute at West Point. His assignments have ranged from the Pentagon to Korea, Iraq, and the U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command. Both gentlemen appeared last year at the Commonwealth Club with their book, Strategy Strikes Back, How Star Wars Explains Modern Military Conflict. They are now co-editors of the forthcoming book, Winning Westeros, How Game of Thrones Explains Modern Military Conflict. As we approach the final season of Game of Thrones, which is expected to draw more than a billion viewers in 170 countries, our guest's new book brings together 30 expert strategists to dissect what is arguably the most popular uh, television series of our time. This year, we thought it would be both fun and engaging to have our guests in conversation with one another. So to discern the fascinating connections between George R. R. Martin's fantasy world and real war and politics, please welcome Max Brooks and Matt Cavanaugh. Now, a couple of years ago, Matt said to me that he, as a strategist, was trying to teach strategy both to the cadets at West Point and to discuss strategy with our Korean allies in South Korea. And it was hard to find these two cultures how do you teach strategy, especially if you have no background in it? Because if you, if you dive deep immediately and you start talking about von Clausewitz, people are gonna fall asleep, yeah. and rightfully so. So how do you get people who are not naturally strategic thinkers to think about strategy? What is the language you use? Matt thought about Star Wars. Everybody's watched it, everybody knows it, and that was his in, and he said to me, what about writing a book, getting all of the important thinkers together? <coughs> people in the military, people in government, uh, great, great thinkers, and you, Max, and we'll get all together <laughs> and we'll write essays teaching strategy through Star Wars. I was like, well, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And we did, and that's why we were here last year where we did Strategy Strikes Back, and it was a big success, and it was a great bridge. Uh, because as civilians, as citizens, we need to learn about this. Because we're getting into some really scary times. This is why I'm here. I'm here as a civilian to talk to my fellow civilians about why we need to learn about strategy. And remember, I didn't say violence. I said strategy because it matters to us because like it or not, we don't live in a bubble and we don't just live in our own homes and our own lives in the United States of America. We live in a global community and in that global community is competition. And a lot of those competitors out there don't live the way we do and don't have the same rights and privileges that we do and don't want those rights and privileges to spread. And I think a lot of us would agree that we are living in a time where democracy is not only under siege, but in retreat in certain parts of the world. And we as voters, this is why it's so critical, as voters, it's all on us. In America, you don't get to blame the government because we are the government. We have the power to shape our own destiny, but we can't do that if we don't know how. We have to learn about these big issues that may not be particularly tasteful and they may not be particularly comfortable. But as citizens, as voters, it is necessary for us to learn. That's why I came on board for that first project to do Strategy Strikes Back and that's why we did the second project, Winning Westeros. What's it about, Matt? So, uh, 
our foreword for this book was written by Admiral James Stavridis, uh, who was the former Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. And there was a line that comes out of that foreword that just leapt off the page and grabbed me by the shirt. And you can see, by the way, our shirt sleeves are rolled up. We are here to do some work to talk about Game of Thrones. Um, what if questions are the root of strategic thinking? You know, the ability to, to see what doesn't exist yet before it actually comes to fruition. You know, the ability to see a different uh, future, to create some new reality before it actually exists in your mind. Um, to use fiction and film uh, to help you better able, make you able to create that picture in your mind. Um, frankly, uh, World War Z is fantastic, not necessarily for the zombies. The zombies are entertaining. But for me, the, the education comes in thinking through what responding to a global fast-moving pandemic would be like. You know, uh, fiction and film can help us see uh, the world that doesn't exist and then design ways to counter the bad and accentuate the good. Um, you know, there, there are two different groups of people, I think, that do a wonderful job at, at grabbing us by the shirt and making us care. Um, and those are war correspondents and journalists and storytellers. Um, you know, when you watch Game of Thrones, it doesn't matter who you are. Um, my wife and I actually are not huge fans of a whole lot of violence on screen, uh, but we watch the show uh, because it's, it's got such a wonderful plot line um, despite the violence. But I, I, you know, there are people that say that, that Game of Thrones can teach you lessons about... Um, the Magna, I, I read online that you can learn lessons about the Magna Carta, the perfect wedding, um, you know, how to live a better life. But everyone in this room knows very well that the core of the program is about war and human conflict. And one thing that everybody that watches that show gets is that war is terrible. You know, war is cruel. War um, takes innocent lives, good people, uh, nice people, kind people, uh, they die in the worst, most tragic ways. And being in the army myself, I know that that's a reflection of reality. So one of the first casualties in my first tour in Iraq in 2003 was a tank driver um, who uh, was rolling through the desert, crested a hill, and then put the tank down, nose down into a wadi, which is like a big puddle and the tank got lodged in the wadi, and he drowned in the hatch because he couldn't get out. Um, he had a, a, a wife and a, and a daughter at home. Um, war is randomly cruel, and, and we see that on the show. We've all seen that on the show, and if, if there's a character that you, you start to like and you care about and you, en you enjoy that person and you lose that person randomly, violently, then you get a fraction of a sense of what it's like to lose someone in a real war. And, and that's, a, that's a feeling that I can't replicate in any other way in any of the other writing that I do. And, and in a lot of ways... That's why I never told you this, Max, but I wanted to dedicate this book to Hodor. Hmm. Because hmm. a lot of you know the show. For some of you that don't, it's very likely that he had a glimpse of what the end of his life would look like. He knew what was coming for him, and he still held the door closed. He still held back evil despite knowing what that sacrifice, what that would cost him. And there's a whole lot of other people out there, 250,000 Americans serving in uniform right now overseas, that many of which, they're willing to do very much the same thing, despite what it might cost them. 
And so I want people to sort of feel that. That's what I think the power of what George R. R. Martin and D.B. Weiss and, and uh, David Benioff have created in the books and the show. Um, and if, if people can, can start to feel that, uh, that's probably the, the, a message that, that I think will, will harden Americans' resolve in thinking harder about the, the real conflicts that we're a part of. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and I think it's, we can't have too many bridges between the American people and those who protect them. You know, my father was in World War II, and his generation did not put the military on a pedestal because they all had been at one point. And that filtered down to the people that they elected. And there's a reason that in my father's time, there was World War II, and then Korea, and a big span before Vietnam. Now, because we have this volunteer military that we don't know anything about anymore, that almost none of us have served, don't know anyone who has served, there's a reason that we're now in wars all over the world. These little conflicts in which Americans are getting killed because it's not us. And that's what Matt is saying, is that when you see a story, the point of a storyteller is to make you feel, is to make you see, is to connect. And hopefully, if we can tell more stories, we can connect to people living lives that we know nothing about anymore. Because that's what we've done. We've, we've taken men and women like him, and we've put them on a pedestal, and we say, thank you for your service, but go, go, go do your thing. I don't want to know about it. And we can't do that anymore, not just morally, but also sustainably. The most powerful nation in the world cannot afford to use that kind of power without us holding the levers of power, understanding what we're getting into. So any way we can learn is important. That's why we did this. Matt, do you wanna just talk for a second about the essay you wrote? Yeah. Because what happens is everybody in the book Everyone from the has written an essay, taken one piece of Game of Thrones, and used that little piece to teach something specific about strategy. So, Matt, what was yours? So, uh, and actually, it relates to my my dissertation. Um, so, hopefully, I can do this in a way that doesn't put you all to sleep. Um, but I wanted to use Jon Snow. Uh, as a way of talking about the qualities in strategic leadership that are successful. You know, it's not just great hair, um, it's got great which hair. clearly I lack, um, but... By choice. But uh, That's right, for that's those right. Of, for those of you that's listening right. but not watching, he's got a great head of roots. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, what are the qualities that you can actually see on screen in Jon Snow that we as a public should want to see replicated in our real strategic leaders. And there's a, a sort of a, a thing about Jon Snow that, that he's heroic, not strategic, that um, he rushes off um, he, into sort of noble battle, but he does it kind of stupidly. Um, leaders make mistakes, even the best of them. Um, and I actually saw, I wrote it with a, it, with a co-writer, um, Peter Singer, P.W. Singer, and, and we actually saw a number of characteristics uh, that you can see in the series in Jon Snow that you can also see in George Washington, actually. Um, sort of a, a personal magnetism, you know, uh, a checkered childhood. So George Washington lost his father at age 11, um, his older brother Lawrence uh, became sort of a surrogate father and he lost Lawrence at age 20. Um, he, uh, was, he navigated his way between sort of lower class and higher born individuals in Virginia society. Uh, he was not always terribly militarily successful. Uh, both very much knew the value of allies so in 1776, 
George Washington as his army is getting beaten and, and uh, kicked out of New York State and then all the way across New Jersey is still sending dispatches at a regular pace to the governors of various states and militias. Um, he's sending dispatches to Native American uh, tribes to try and keep them uh, from joining the British side in the war. Um, he knows the value of allies later in the war in that he brings in the French. Jon Snow, the same thing. He knows that in the long run, the force that he has will not be sufficient. And it, even if he gets all the allies he wants, it, it may never be sufficient. Um, they also make decisions for the long run as opposed to the tactical short term. And one thing with George Washington is he probably actually lost more battles than any general officer we've had in the United States Army, but he won the war that mattered the most. And I see some of those same qualities in Jon Snow. And without even really knowing it, most of America, the folks that have watched this show that have made it the most popular show on television and the book series as well, um, they've been getting a lesson in strategic leadership. Uh, there are a whole lot of other essays that are drawing out some of those same lessons that uh, folks in uniform see uh, and want to share with uh, people that, that aren't in uniform because there's a connection. Uh, as Max mentioned, I, I work for you. Um, my life and my, you know, the success of our conflicts depends on wise citizen choices. Um, and that includes picking leaders that, that are good ones. And I, I think there are some qualities in Jon Snow that, uh, that we should learn from. So why don't we go to some, one of the questions? Yeah, good idea. Uh, <clears throat> what has been your favorite battle scene depicted in the series? I, I know mine. All right. Uh, well, so the Battle of the Bastards, because again, this is one of those moments where um, you are seeing a remix of history put on screen. The, the creators of the series are actually spending tens of millions of dollars to show the world what the Battle of Cannae looked like uh, in the, the Second Punic Wars uh, between the Romans and Hannibal. Uh, if you remember, those of you that, that have watched the show, if you remember the bodies that are stacked up that's actually taken directly from the American Civil War in Virginia in 1864. Um, the, you know, this, this, is, this is what fiction often is. It's directly taken from the real world. I remember when you told me about the 10th man, yeah. the 10th man from World War Z, if you could. Right, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> in World War Z, I, have, I talk about how the Israelis are ahead of the game because unlike... Uh, the intelligence services around the world, including CIA, uh, the Israelis are impervious to groupthink because I had heard an NPR interview with um, an Israeli intel analyst who said in 1973, we almost got wiped out because everybody in the room all agreed on something and we were all wrong. And from that point on, we, ha we ensure that if there's 10 people in the room, the 10th man, probably woman now, 10th man or woman, uh, is obligated to make the argument against it. So there has to be debate. There has to be thinking because Israel can't afford that. It's a tiny little country. They make a mistake, they're gone. And so I took that notion of the 10th man, put it into World War Z. So Israel is one of the only countries to see the zombie plague coming because the 10th man in the room says, what if they're actually zombies? What if that's not a code word? And that is learning from history and putting it in fiction. How would a modern military's strategy differ in dealing with an enemy like the White Walkers? I think when we talk about modern, that's a really good question because are we talking about a modern democracy or are we talking about a modern dictatorship? And this is what I talked about before. You don't get to blame the government in America. If the government is not working, that's our fault. Uh, so if we're talking about an army 
of a democracy, then we as the citizens need to know whether this is important or not. And an army that is a democracy votes on whether you go to war and also how you conduct the war. In any of our conflicts, we voted for that. And we also voted to end it. I mean, if you look at World War II, there was this urge at, from the top of, oh my God, we need to wrap this thing up because the citizenry is not gonna stand for this. As opposed to now where we're all checked out. So that's, a, if there were white walkers attacking America, well, maybe nowadays, oh God. But let's say the white walkers attacked us in 1941. We'd be ready. Now, there are countries around the world where it is ruled from the top down and the entire fate of the nation is up to a few people. If the White Walkers attacked China, they're not attacking China, they're attacking Xi Jinping. So it's all up to this one dude, how they respond. And then also, does he worry about a coup? So that's how it would be in a dictatorship. Uh, so it's, it's a different kind of army. What kind of army are we talking about? Yeah. I mean, in the, in the real world, the way that I'm conditioned to think is often that we fight uh, hard, uh, but that we do it in such a way that, that we, have, we preserve the ability to make peace post-conflict. Because the objective, no matter what, is a better peace that exist, than existed before. But with the, frankly, with the White Walkers, um, which I don't think are all that dissimilar from, say, um, a drug-resistant germ, right. uh, like uh, or Ebola, or a virus that or, can't be, or a terrorist group in 2000 that had a yeah. intel memo that said White Walkers determined to attack America. Uh, sometimes we get the warnings, yeah, and sometimes even in a democracy. If we're not plugged in, because let's remember, 9-11 happened at the end of the 90s, after a full decade of us thinking it was the end of history. So we didn't have to keep our eye on the ball. So sometimes, just like in Game of Thrones, the warnings are there, Yeah. but we're not paying attention. I mean, uh, if, if this is an opponent that, that cannot, you cannot broker a better peace with, than the, the only strategy that you have. I mean, generally speak, speaking, there are three strategies that exist. There aren't any more than that. There's annihilation. There's attrition. And there's exhaustion. So when you seek to annihilate an adversary, you seek to end all of them, which is the most brutal and, and vicious, the worst. Uh, when you seek to attrit an adversary, you're seeking to uh, run down their ability to fight, to kill their capabilities, not necessarily the people. And then third, you're looking to exhaust their will to continue the struggle. Well, if you're fighting as, uh, you know, white walkers, th their will is ceaseless. Their capability will not stop and all that's left is annihilation. I mean, which is the scary thing. And the truth of the matter is in the show, I don't know whether or not they have enough dragon glass or obsidian or dragons to be able to annihilate the adversary. So, I mean, th this, is a, this, is the, this is the tough thing. This is the tough thing. Um, Which, by the way, never should have happened had they been paying attention to their security concerns. Because peace doesn't mean there's never the threat. You know, w Matt was just talking about a virus. Do we remember a little while ago when Ebola exploded across West Africa? And for the first time, the U.S. Army went in, and it was actually a great response. But what we've been doing recently is winning wars and losing the peace. And we did that. We went in. We won the war against Ebola. But we didn't make sure that we established a monitoring system around West Africa in case it rose again. And literally on the way to the airport here, I'm hearing reports about Congo. Here we go again. I mean, to, to some extent with the White Walker threat as well, it's, it's one of those moments where you see the repercussions when there's a schism or a split between society and its soldiers and scholars. So um, famously in the beginning of the series, you know, the, the, the Night's Watch is sort of disconnected 
irrelevant from the rest of society. They're laughed at to some degree. Thank you for your service. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they send Raven south, warning of the threat. They, you know, they try to sound the alarm of what the problem is, and nobody's really listening. And then when Sam Tarley goes to the Citadel, and he's with the academics of Westeros, and he explains to them what he's seen with his own two eyes, um, the maesters laugh at him, and they choose to stay sort of locked in their ivory tower. You know, th this is a lesson in and of itself. This is why we've written this book. This is why we're sitting in this room, because there needs to be a connection between the people in uniform serving, the people that think very much about national security issues, and the, the rest of the society. Because sure, there is a pointy end of the spear, but that rest of the shaft of society's spear is constructed and built and wielded by everyone in a community. Armies alone don't wage war, societies wage war, and we, we all have a stake in this. Which, so. by the way, if we don't feel this way, our enemies do. And we have to remember this. We don't exist in a bubble. You know, we can self-identify as a nation that lets its military go to war, but we're out of it. We're not involved. Well, that's not how they see us. When bin Laden attacked us, he specifically said, all of America is the target. I'm not just attacking the American military. I'm attacking the United States of America. And that is because for me, one of my favorite characters in the show is the guy killed by the flying bell when the tower blows up. I don't know if you remember this, when Cersei blows up the tower with the green glowing gunpowder or whatever it's called, and the, and the whole tower goes up and all the CGI characters are running for their life, and this one poor CGI schmuck gets hit with the bell. He didn't ask for that, <laughs> all right? That wasn't his choice, but Neither do all the people in London and Dresden and Hiroshima, all right? This is the problem with war. It's not just fought by warriors. There's a lot of people caught in the middle of this. You know, the people on 9-11 did not understand the complex geopolitical decisions that created Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, but they suffered for it. And that's what we need to remember. So when I watched Game of Thrones, I paused the DVR when I saw that guy get hit by the bell because I'm like, that is what happens in war. That's the casualty. So there's a question here that I would actually love to answer. Um, do today's leaders need to be as ruthless as characters on Game of Thrones? And that's because uh, I, I also wrote a chapter on Ned Stark. Um, because the, the sort of received or conventional wisdom on the character Ned Stark is that he was brave but stupid, um, that he should have played his hand differently and he would have survived. Um, that may or may not be the case, but the argument that I made in, in the essay was um, that good guys do win in the end. It just takes a little bit longer and it doesn't always seem to happen. But Here's why, you know, Charles Darwin was very confused by heroes because he sort of said um, selfish bastards' children would survive because they would, they would privilege the protection of their offspring, whereas um, a, hero's, a hero would just run off and get themselves killed and then the line would die off. That, I, I don't think that was necessarily the case. I think that... Um, in the longer run, uh, human beings are social, and we, our superpower, frankly, is our ability to cooperate in large groups. Mm -hmm. And we honor and appreciate, and we're inspired by people that not just sacrifice for others, but serve others. And I think that's what we get out of a character like Ned Stark. In the classic sense, he lost his head. <laughs> but when you, when you, that if that's only if you look at him in the span of one lifespan, in lifetime, if you look, you take sort of a wider angle view, he inspired others. 
He had allies, people that remembered him favorably. The character that we see his ideals live on with is Jon Snow. You know, I, I think the good guys do tend to win on balance, not always. And I, I think ruthless characters do well in the short run. But in the longer run, the, the, the good folks tend to do well. And I, I think in this final season... Um, look at who's lined up behind Cersei Lannister. You know, they're either paid for or it's just someone that wants to get laid. <laughs> but Jon Snow and Daenerys are followed by people that are volunteering, people that care, people that want to see. They, they're inspired by ideas, break the wheel, change the way things are free the slaves yeah and uh, so i i, I do i i don't yeah. think leaders today need to be as ruthless as game of no Thrones. of course not because you're you're not fighting also in the moment it's it's just what matt said you're, you're you're fighting for an enduring ideal now we all know uh, i don't know if we all know this but have you heard the name uh, just show of hands who has heard of john Callie? all right I, in a room of a hundred i see about five people go up for those of you who don't he was the lieutenant uh, who orchestrated the My Lai Massacre in Vietnam. That's why most of you don't know who he is. Because that's not an ideal that we teach our children. That's not a children's book. All right? That's not something you learn in class. That's not a U2 song. Show of hands, who's heard of Martin Luther King? All right. Who died first, John Kelly or Martin Luther King? Martin Luther King. But what he lived for will live forever. That's why we can't be that kind of ruthlessness. And I think that kind of ruthlessness also says something about who you want to be. There's two towns, Milai and Lidice. Anyone heard of Lidice? It's a town in the Czech Republic. And during World War II, when Czech partisans tried to assassinate and did Reinhard Heydrich, the man who invented the Holocaust, the Nazis responded by surrounding that town and completely wiping it out. All the men, dead. Women, either dead or sent into concentration camps. Children, either in concentration camps or if they were Aryan looking enough, sent to be adopted by Aryan families. Town destroyed, animals killed, river diverted through the town. How is that different from me, Lai? Me lie, those in power tried to hush it up because that's not who we are. Lidice was publicized. It was destroyed specifically to be publicized because that's exactly who the Nazis were. Which idea lasts? That's why we can't stoop to the immediate level of brutality and violence, even if in the moment it serves a very narrow short-term purpose. Which character is the best strategist in Game of Thrones and the worst? Well, the ones who are still alive. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean you, you, you've you got to give uh, Tyrion. You got to give yeah. him. You got to give him props because I, I think what, what Tyrion teaches about strategy is that he turns his greatest weakness into a strength. And that's a great lesson for strategy because Tyrion started out with nothing. He was the bastard. He was, he's not a great physical fighter, obviously. Uh, he should have been dead. He should have been the first guy to go. And yet he's still around because his weakness turned him into an amazing fighter. He did not have that kind of sort of arrogance that his brother did, who lost his hand. And most of the characters die because they're arrogant, because they start off as amazing warriors, and then they die at a red wedding. Uh, Tyrion knew how to survive to fight another day. I think if there is, on a strategic scale, I think he would be Vowin Jap. Mm -hmm. And if anybody knows who Vowin Jap is, he is the Vietnamese general who defeated us in Vietnam. 
And before he defeated us, he defeated the French. And before he defeated the French, he outlasted the Japanese. And before the Japanese, he survived French colonialism. He should have been dead immediately. And yet somehow, he led the armed forces and the irregular forces of this tiny little country to outlast the greatest military power in the history of the human race. So I'll go with who the worst is. Uh, it, it, for me, it's Stannis Baratheon. <laughs> St Stannis um, is brave. He fights well. But he's obstinate. He's inflexible. Um, strategy presumes the recognition of an other, that, that it's a competitive endeavor, and it's, it's entirely rational. Um, you show up, <laughs> you fight. And your way. We, we you, see, you fight your way. That's right. The way you want to fight, the way you're trained to fight. Which, and we see the results. We get, the, you know, we get feedback very quickly. You know, and it's a lot worse than the national championship basketball game, right? Yeah. Um, and the thing with Stannis for me was that he sort of said, I don't really need to engage deeply in thinking about my opponents. I've got this higher power that's going to take care of it all for me. And that's not a comment or a slight against religion in, in any way. Um, you know, there are religious people on the battlefield, and I can tell you from personal experience, there, there are atheists in foxholes. Um, but when you think that you don't need to engage in strategic thinking because you've got some magic higher power that's going to fire the lightning bolts of Zeus and remove all obstacles in your way, despite terrible weather, it, terrible terrain, conditions that your forces aren't equipped to fight in, then the results speak for themselves. Um, and, and on Tyrion, he loses. He takes some lumps occasionally. Um, our, our best military strategists in the United States have taken their lumps as well. I mentioned George Washington lost a great many battles and won the war that mattered. Um, Ulysses S. Grant uh, should probably, if, if, if you look at, if you want an unblemished perfect record, uh, he's not the guy. In fact, when he was out of the military, uh, he was so poor at one point and unsuccessful as a civilian that he had to pawn his watch to pay for his children's Christmas presents. Um, but on the battlefield, <clears throat> he, he did better than his opponent when it mattered the most. And, and that's a really good point about defeat. Defeat and adversity are your best tools for teaching because Grant came after a guy, George B. McClellan. Now, McClellan was a golden boy. McClellan was just academic and he was gorgeous and he never lost anything. And it was, he had had a meteoric rise until things got really serious and suddenly he was in command of the Grand Army and he was too terrified to fight because now he could really lose. And he had never had any losses. And he was paralyzed. And he kept saying to Lincoln, I need more men, I need more guns, I need more butter, I just, I just need more because they're everywhere. And Lincoln was like, dude, you gotta actually fight the enemy to win the war, and he wouldn't do it. He was so petrified of losing his winning streak that he wouldn't do anything. As opposed to Grant, up and down, up and down. And there's that picture of Grant. I think it's on his new biography. And you see in his eyes, he knows about loss. Personal loss, financial loss, loss of his own faculties when he drank too much. You know, Grant was not, I suspect, I don't think he was an alcoholic. I think he would go on benders. Yeah. And when he went on benders, he lost it all. And then he would lose men in the field. Yeah. And that was all there. So when he was put on on the general's horse, he knew exactly what he was getting into. Yeah, that was one of the things that, that came out in my dissertation research with Grant, with Washington, and Eisenhower, all three of them at very pivotal moments of the heaviest fighting actually had to sort of sequester themselves 
uh, in their own quarters, and they cried. I mean, just the weight of that much human loss on your own shoulders, uh, knowing that they were the ones that were the making decisions that cost so many young lives. And I just, I just want to say quickly, that is, a, that is critical. That kind of loss is critical into a democracy self-correcting in war. Because in war, that trickles down. In democracy, those losses trickle down to the citizenry who then get to have a say in what happens. And it forces the military leadership to be smarter, to be better, because those are mothers and fathers' sons. And that will cost them, as opposed to a dictatorship where you can just throw them. There was a very famous battle in World War II called Tarawa, where the Marines hit the beaches and they didn't have the right equipment and they didn't scout the beaches correctly and they didn't use enough preliminary naval and air bombardment. And those Marines took, we always hear about Iwo Jima, but Tarawa, they took horrific losses. And Admiral Nimitz, who was in charge of that, who was commander of the Pacific Fleet, got stacks of letters from mothers. And they would say, you killed my son at Tarawa. And you better believe the next time those Marines landed, they had worked those problems out. Any lessons about superpowers intervention in conflicts abroad? So from the series, you know, the, the one that jumps out at me is mind the map. Uh, Geostrategy matters. So geography, the relationship between force and space. Everybody that's watched the show has seen those opening credits and the, the map that you slide through. You're, you're without even sort of consciously thinking about it, you know that as the phrase goes, where, if where you stand depends on where you sit, in Game of Thrones, how you fight depends on where you're from. Southern armies don't do well, as Stannis didn't do well in the north. Um, the Dothraki never, ever cross the Narrow Sea until they do. Right, um, the Iron Islands—they they go from yeah. being an, a sort of an isolationist pirate state yeah. into an active interventionist state and part of an alliance. Yeah, so I mean, uh, these things—the the, the, I've heard this phrase before and I love it—the realities and the mentalities of the localities. Mm. It, it, every group of people, depending on where you're from, think differently, fight differently, and think about fighting differently. You know, these things matter. They matter in the show and the series, and they matter in the real world. You know, and Syria is a, I mean, that, that was one of the, in parenthesis, it said Syria, for example. Intervention in Syria is just so hard because if Game of Thrones seems like it's tribal and, um, you know, factional, yeah. uh, <laughs> Syria is, is Game of Thrones on steroids in that, in that way. Yeah, especially because we have to remember that Syria is not a country. In, in the sense, it is not a nation state. It is not Iran. It is not Japan. It is not a place where, where common people have come together on a piece of land and have become a state. It is a post-colonial construct, post-Ottoman Empire, where uh, the French and British just went through and just drew lines in the sand. And it didn't matter if there were different groups who had nothing to do with each other. They just said, you know, uh, well, this is Syria. Sorry, wrong accent. Oh, this is Syria. Oh, we, <laughs> oh, we are leaving. The war is over. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? And so a lot of this is trying to clean up a mess that began a hundred years ago and has just had a, a, a pot boiler on top of it waiting for it to burst. To the point of wise choices made by the people, how do, we, how do we as the people pick leaders, good leaders, in a world of disinformation and fake news and propaganda? I don't think that's such a hard question. I think you have to find news sources, number one, that you trust, and you trust them by looking at the facts, and you look at the facts by checking them with other news sources, and you also check by seeing, does this news organization ever apologize when they get something wrong? 
Or do they just say, yep, right all the time? That's one. Uh, are there reporters paid? I think that's a big deal. I think that when you pay a reporter to go somewhere and do a job, that's very different than an amateur uh, who just says, well, I'm just going to sit home and do that. But I think if you, if you look at enough of the issues and learn, when the politicians speak, you can call them on that. And I think this is the problem. I remember uh, a few years ago, I, Matt, were you at, were you at uh, Tradox Mad Scientist a few years ago? No. Yeah. I, I, it, the Army's Training and Doctrine Command had something called the Mad Scientist Conference, where they brought in all these amazing thinkers to talk about the big global trends uh, that were going to affect us and were affecting us right now. And I would sit there for 12 hours a day for three days and just, just get hit with this tsunami of information. Then I would go back and watch CNN. None of these issues were on there. And then I would turn on MSNBC. None of these issues were on there. And then I would turn on Fox, and I don't even know what was on there. <laughs> but nothing that I had heard was anywhere in this media. So choosing where you get your information, a lot of that just comes over time. You know, you're not just going to read one newspaper or see one program and say, ah, they must know what they're talking about. You learn, you vet it, and then eventually you say, okay, you have earned my trust. And you will, I trust you to educate me so then I can vet who I vote for to be in power. How would you rate the Unsullied as a military? And, um, well, I mean, I'm, they're brave. For those of you that haven't seen the series or know the show, they're, they're, they're a group of men that are castrated very young and raised in a sort of very brutal way um, so that they are almost like fighting machines, aut automatons. Um, we've seen attempts like this to create almost, you would call them super soldiers through history. Um, it, at varying points, the Spartans to some degree did the same thing. The Janissaries uh, that served the uh, Turk, you know, what would now we would call the Turkish uh, today. But, but here's the thing. They are utterly divorced and disconnected from society. You know, I, I liken that relationship to a spear point that's connected to a shaft. You know, the spear, the tip is relatively small, but the shaft is long and it's, it's very strong and it supports and sustains that spear point. It gives it reach. That's what makes a spear a spear. A spear has reach. Absolutely. Without and, a home front, you have no reach. And they, they may fight well tactically, but they'll, and they'll probably win fights, but they won't win wars. Um, in part because, like you just mentioned, uh, Max, they, th there is no self-correction. If, if, if you lose an unsullied, you have lost someone who is not married or has children or family anymore. They've been separated from society almost completely. Whereas in a democracy like, like we are in, um, in theory, th there's a political feedback loop that self-corrects and helps society make better, wiser choices in the long run. So I, I think the Unsullied are tactically excellent, yeah. but s strategically not so great. And here's another dark <clears throat> place when we talk about the military as an institution. The Unsullied are perfect to mention, to bring up, because the Unsullied cannot be trusted. They will turn, as they did. Why? because they are an isolated, self-contained organism completely detached from any country. So they might win on the battlefield, but what's to stop them from having a coup? And that's really important. Uh, in, the, in the 1990s, when the Taliban took over Afghanistan, a lot of people were asking, how can the Taliban be so brutal to their own people? Well, the answer is, that wasn't their people. The first wave of the Taliban that conquered Afghanistan in the 90s were not Afghans. They were of Afghan descent who grew up in refugee camps in Pakistan in the 80s. 
So to them, Afghanistan was a foreign country. That wasn't their sister or their aunt or their mother or their neighbor that they were throwing acid in the face of. That wasn't the Buddha that they were playing under as children that they blew up. So that is a perfect example of taking a military organization, an armed and dangerous organization, and completely divorcing it from the people because then they have no loyalty to the people and they can then be an instrument of whomever wields that power. How has Game of Thrones been influenced by battles and events through history? We talked about Canning. Yep. There's more. Um, Game of Thrones didn't just come whole cloth out of nowhere. Uh, George R. R. Martin has described in, in the fall of 1981, he went on a trip to, uh, to Hadrian's Wall in the United Kingdom, and it was sort of a dark fall day, and he stood on top of it and sort of envisioned what it would be like to be a Roman legionnaire feeling like you were at the end of the civilized world. And frankly, when, when he described that in that interview, I was thinking about my own experience just a couple years ago in Korea, not far south of the DMZ. So our world has walls and there are people that are standing on top of them. Um, the black, uh, the, the red wedding, uh, it, it was inspired by the black wedding of Scotland, um, which is, uh, has been described as a, in, throughout history, it's been called a treacherous feast. Um, you, you've seen it as a recurring theme in a way of uh, defeating and killing your adversaries in a sort of really cheap way of, of, of doing it. Dragons, you could consider those a stand-in for air power. <clears throat> yeah, see, see, for me, the dragons have a whole other thing. For me, the dragons represent the secret police. Because Daenerys, what, what really protects Daenerys? All right? She has wonderful words and she inspires people like all good dictators do. All right? All successful dictators inspire people. I free you from your chains. Join me, join me, join me. Great. But if the Unsullied ever turned on her, if the Dothraki ever turned on her, she has what I call the flying Gestapo who are absolutely fiercely loyal. Because this is what happens in any dictatorship, any dictatorship, you have to have two armies. No dictatorship survives on one military. There always has to be two. And the reason you always have to have two is so they will compete with each other and never gang up and kill the leader. And so that's why you have to have an SS, you have to have a KGB or an NKVD, you have to have a SAVAK, uh, and that's why those paramilitary organizations, a revolutionary guard, they have to be as well armed as the proper military because they have to be ready to keep them in line. So when I see those dragons, I think, okay, Daenerys is doing exactly what every dictator has done. Okay, this one's for you. Oh. Brad Pitt's a lovely man. <laughs> a lovely guy. I just, uh, all those... Two times I've met him. He's a very cool guy. What? He's okay. <laughs> when writing for G.I. Joe, which, which do you consider more of a threat, Cobra or the White Walkers? Uh, see, now that, see, the White Walkers, uh, I don't think are that much a, uh, they're a threat in, on the tactical short-term level because they're like zombies. There's no fear and there's no doubt uh, and they're, you, you can't psych them out. I mean, they're just coming for you. It's like trying to reason with Ebola. It's coming. But they can't, you can outthink the White Walkers. And also the White Walkers are just about the king. You kill the king, you're done. White Walkers are done. But you kill Cobra Commander, you got Destro, you got Major Blood, You've got Zartan, very underrated. Zartan who could look like any of the other ones. <laughs> You've got the Tomax and Zaymot. You have a whole chain of command in Cobra, and any one of them is looking to jump in and take over the Reich. So, no, the, the White Walkers, and I think this is very important when we talk about democracies versus um, 
dictatorships because we all look at China. Oh, they're so efficient. You know, they get stuff done. They do until they don't. They can't fix the problems because if problems ever arise, they have to cover it up. You know, zombie movies are banned in China, right? Zombie stories. They are because zombie stories by default imply that the system has failed, right? Otherwise, there wouldn't be a zombie plague. In a democracy, you can have that. Oh, the system failed. Where's the government? You can't do that in China because the system is infallible. So the White Walkers, powerful but brittle. Cobra, resilient. So it's hard to go after that. If net, if... If Ned Stark had lived, would conflict have been avoided in Westeros? And my quick take is I, I just don't think so. Um, this is the difference between um, proximate causes of a war and then sort of the underlying causes, the trigger, the things that are actually pushing the conflict, the, the tectonic plates that are underneath the surface that, that matter a whole heck of a lot more. Um, so the, the First World War famously was triggered by the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, but there were a lot of other factors that really were shaping that conflict more than the death of an Austro-Hungarian uh, prince. Yeah, know. right. If, if, <clears throat> if you had either killed Hitler in the 30s or bought his paintings. Uh, just said, wow, you're a really great artist. Keep that up. Don't do anything else. Just keep painting. There, there, there probably would have been a world war, but it might not have looked like that. So, because there were, in the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, we sowed, we sowed a bitter crop, and there had to be some kind of harvest later on. Which tactic ended up being the most costly that we see on screen. Uh, indiscriminate use of fire, I think. You know, um, Daenerys has dragons and now she has competitive, you know, dragons on the other side to deal with. But um, the United States in the past in Korea and Vietnam and in, and in other conflicts has not had an adversary in the air that has been able to fight back. And that has been a very serious and significant advantage to the United States. But you can go too far. Um, drone warfare arguably goes too far in certain circumstances to where the people on the ground that are on the receiving end of that fire uh, do not consider any strike legitimate because they are so overused. And when you get down to it, all war is conducted, as I mentioned before, it's, for, it's meant to be for a better peace and to influence human beings. And if you're overusing your advantage, then you risk alienating the people that you seek to influence to your side. And so that's the one, th I, I think it's debatable whether or not Daenerys should have burned um, the Tarleys. Uh, I, the loot train attack where the dragons are strafing and burning everything for, you know, until the earth is salted and brown and black. Um, I think it's likely that she over, over, overdid it a bit. And it, it, we, don't, we don't know what the blowback will be until this, this next season, obviously. No, and, and that's, the, and that's uh, I think, uh, one of the reasons that I wrote the essay that I wrote, uh, yeah. which is the whole concept of the war is, I think, vile. Because the whole concept of the war is so we can have a good king, right? Jon Snow or Daenerys, or when they get together, Jon Eris. Uh, and that's the notion that these good kings will work. No, there's no such thing. 
There's absolutely no such thing. That, the, the essay I wrote is that you cannot have a good dictatorship because it eventually will go bad. Because what happens if Daenerys and John, they're good now, but you know what? So are most dictators when they start. Young Fidel Castro, young Robert Mugabe, uh, young Muammar Gaddafi, young Colonel Gaddafi, if you read his green book, you were like, this is a really cool guy. They all start out, most of them start out sort of young and idealistic and, and they just wanna help the people. And a few decades later, corrupted by power, they are bathed in blood. So even if they win and this season ends with this wonderful, we've broken the wheel and we're together and we must rule, let's see what happens 30 years from now. <laughs> or let's see what happens, even if they do rule benevolently, who's gonna take over the system that they create? Because Augustus Caesar was a great ruler right until the day he died. But if you set up a system where you get Augustus, you're gonna get Caligula. That's just the way it is. If you set up a system where one person or a few people have all the power, eventually that will turn on you no matter how great it is in the moment. That's why when I was asked to do Game of Thrones, I was like, oh yeah, because let me tell you something. When I go to Comic-Con, as I do very often, uh, you see a lot of people dressed like Jon Snow or Daenerys. You know who you don't see? The butcher's son. That's who my essay was about. The butcher's son who accidentally pissed off Joffrey and was executed. No courts. No free press. None of the things that we in this country take for granted, but the only things that keep our sons and daughters alive. Because in our system, you're not a subject. You're a citizen. And that doesn't just happen. That has to be defended by all of us, all the time, in uniform and out. And I think we've got our... George R. R. Martin, when he was asked where he would like to live, would you like to live in uh, King's Landing? Would you like to live in Dorne? You know, they went through a number of the different cities, and he, he said, well... Santa Fe, New Mexico. We have medicine, and and I can well, I can watch the Jets on TV. Oh. You know, um, that's another thing. I mean, we we want to preserve this amazing place that we live in. Who is the most underestimated character in the series? <sighs> oh, that's a good question. I don't know who do you, I mean, I, my, my underestimated character was killed by a flying bell, so. Yeah, so for me, it's Jamie Lannister, um, or maybe the Hound. I, I want to see human redemption. Um, that, for me, is something that I want to see, and what are your predictions for the final season? <clears throat> well, you know what, now that I've thought about it, you know who my under, under, underestimated character is? The people of Westeros, the people. The people, the extras, all right? The people who don't get lines in the show. In my perfect world, when, when they finally defeat the White Walkers and they defeat yeah, Cersei and, and Daenerys and Jon stand up on the dais in, in their unwashed beauty and they go, yes, then the people say, no, <laughs> no. You've done a great job. Step aside, your term limit is up. It is time for national elections. That would be my perfect ending to yeah. Game of Thrones. I, uh, I think we should probably end on that note. Uh, thank you so much, honestly, from the, the bottom of my heart. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank this, you for coming. This was the perfect day, uh, and it was a fantastic end to the perfect day, and you were all part of that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.